Hey everyone, this is Roman Pokopchuk, and this is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast. Today I have with me John Henry Parker. He is a behavioral assessment analyst and writer who authors work about his own personal hero's journey through trauma, grief, loss, recovery, and personal transformation. Thank you for joining me today. Nice to be here. Looking forward to it. So tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you get to where you are today? Well, my, the, the journey has been a real adventure getting here. Um, I mean, through a lot of adversity as a, as a, as a child, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of abuse from my father as a child and then a lot of violence in the neighborhood around me. And then, uh, growing up into a young man and then going in the Marine Corps, um, more violence, you know, there was just, uh, just a way of being that was kind of instilled into me that, uh, I was very one dimensional, very compressed, very, um, like a very limited range of emotions and a very limited vocabulary. And so I've spent most of my adult life, uh, once I got out of the military, really just unpacking things. And, um, fortunately I found personal development to be the path for me that I, I could, I could learn privately by mostly listening to audiobooks and going to programs and certifications and trainings and I literally got into the field of personal development, working with a lot of best-selling authors, um, because I actually was so passionate about it. I wanted to go work for Tony Robbins and Brian Tracy and Jim Rohn and Tom Hopkins, you know, over a bunch of years. So I could literally like learn how to be walk, talk and act and, and be a civilian, you know, be, be, uh, look somewhat normal and really function in the world of successful people. And so I, I use that as an opportunity to, to understand myself. And then I became a behavioral assessment analyst about 30 years ago, uh, cause I study myself more than anybody else. And I really, uh, I really work with a lot of leaders, a lot of, a lot of CEOs, a lot of companies, uh, looking at conflict, looking at leadership development, looking at talent acquisition, that sort of thing. But the parallel to that is at my passion projects, I've been working with traumatized combat vets for the last 25 years. And really the struggles that veterans have making it back into the world after military service. And uh, th that's what brought me here today is, is that working harder on myself than anything else. And I've author authored a couple of books. And really what it is, Roman, is, is like looking at my life experiences and being able to write about them uh, is a therapeutic writing process that I, it, it, it never was supposed to turn into two books, two audio books. But after a lot of soul searching, I decided to publish this very personal amount of work about the journey. So it's not the typical self-development book about do these three things and you'll be successful. It is about visceral learning through experiences. Um, so the book, the, the, the book that just came out is called Be the Dawn in the Darkness. And the subtitle is The Relentless Pursuit of Becoming Who We Are Meant to Be. So I took a lot of time to intentionally create those titles in the subtitle because to me, uh, I, I love watching people learn and grow. And I do that through storytelling and personal experiences and I find because, because I'm not a licensed mental health professional, ethically, I can talk about personal stories that tend to get a level of credibility, I guess, with people who are struggling. Like they get that I've struggled. They get that I have overcome a lot. And it develops a level of neutrality and rapport that often, most, most, most often leads to trust pretty quickly. So, you know, now that the book's out, uh, I also had to be really uncomfortable with the fact that I'm going to have to do a bunch of podcasts and talk about this work. But the more I'm doing it, the more comfortable I'm becoming about this is important. This needs to be done and I need to be uncomfortable and go first. And um, otherwise, who's going to pick up the book, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it's important to be um, relatable. Oftentimes, obviously, coming from a situation where you understand it, where you can help other people. So finding like, like, you know, myself being a foster parent, like, you know, people say it's commendable, but I need another person that's a foster parent to understand kind of the struggles and things that I go through on a, on an everyday basis per se. And I know obviously you, your background, you served in the military and seen, you know, people within the military and how that impacts them. Have you had, you know, an impact yourself where it was traumatizing that then you kind of got yourself out of it as well in your military service? Yeah, I, I carried a lot of rage. And there's a chapter in my book called Retribution is Far Beyond Rage. You know, I had a couple of really bad things happen that soured my perspective, you know. And, um, you know, I, I got in a confrontation with about six guys that wasn't supposed to happen. And, <laughs> you know, and so I that's just, just one of a few things that, that really kind of skewed my outlook for a lot of years. And, um, Trauma is an inter interesting thing. We, I, for me, I just, I, I masked it as best I could, you know, especially after I got out, I just wanted to be successful. I just wanted to be normal. And, uh, but I carried a lot of, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And, uh, and my dad was a, was a combat vet who really suffered. He was in Korea and Vietnam. He was a Marine Corps combat vet in Korea. So alcoholic, rageaholic. You know, then my son, he did two tours in Afghanistan, two deployments in Afghanistan with the Army 10th Mountain Division. He had his own set of challenges, lots of trauma. Um, you know, and he ultimately made it back from Afghanistan, but got killed on his motorcycle, you know, doing an adrenaline seeking. He, he needed the adrenaline so he could actually get that fixed so he could relax and then come home and go to sleep. And that's what ultimately killed him is this he lost control of his motorcycle one night, you know? So, um, so my, my trauma comes in lots of different forms. I mean, grief and loss. I lost my only brother, uh, my older brother to a motorcycle accident as well, speed related motorcycle accidents. And so, um, and I talk about all this, you know, really very candidly. And so people can understand the phases of grief and loss and, and trauma and how, how, if you're, if you're lucky, we mature through our trauma. Like I became the wounded healer for a decade after my son got killed. You know, I, I needed to be around other people who were in pain. Um, I, I just felt really, I didn't know what else to do, but being of service and support to other people helped me move my pain to where I, I could function. And then eventually I started maturing in my awareness about what gave my life meaning and purpose. And I started um, getting a, a healthy balance with my loss. Like I still have it. I still grieve, but um, I'm, a, I'm a lot healthier now in my, in, in how I, I, I live my life. Yeah. And, and everyone goes through some form of, you know, trauma, grief, loss in their lifetime, regardless how, you know, traumatic, if it's a death, if it's um, something in the military, but it's kind of like, you know, at the time you have to figure out what your own way is to kind of cope with it and live with it because it truly doesn't go away. Like you said, obviously you're losing uh, loved ones that stays with you, but at the time you have to go through some kind of natural healing process and kind of closure where that kind of uh, initial event is like a, a wound and that wound like learning to live with it i think they say time heals when you take the steps to to do so because if you don't time is just going to drag on that pain but if you do go through kind of a healing process then eventually those wounds become scars they're still memories of the event what you've overcome as a people that you know lost close to you but you can at least somewhat live a fulfilling life and not let that kind of uh burden hold you down yeah i um i think about how how trauma has informed me and how has it impact how has it, it's impacted me and i'm fortunate in that i was able to surround myself with some 
mentors who, who, uh, bumped into me at the right times of my life and started directing me towards personal development and uh, figuring out like, who am I becoming? Focus on who you're becoming. You know, the world doesn't need you to be in this locked up sense of this military bearing and this mindset or who you were as a kid, you know, and I'll tell you some of the things that really impact me the most is I came across uh, a couple of mentors who had me take a, a five minute communication survey that opened my eyes so quickly to how I was getting in my own way. I was startled. Like it took me just a few minutes to do this little survey. And when they sat down and showed me what it was about, it was actually a survey that the roots of the, of the, of the technology, the, the research, uh, was actually done during World War II when they were trying to differentiate from the civilian population of men who needed to become fighter pilots versus bomber pilots. And, uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, they would use this tool to figure out highly aggressive people needed to go to fighter school and highly meticulous structured thinkers who maybe didn't like conflict needed to go to bomber school because they had a huge attrition rate in both schools. But when they commissioned a panel of scholars to come in and look at the best pilots in each area, they quickly discovered a set of traits that were key and consistent to the high performers in both categories. So I came across uh, this survey like 35 years ago. And when they sat me down, they said, here's, here's the deal. This tells us that I can, I'm just going to summarize in just a little bit of time here. Your need for control is your highest need. Well, I already knew that. And your need for freedom and autonomy is a competing need, a significant need. What that means is my need for control conflicted with my need to not be controlled. And I, I said, when, tell me that again and help me break that down. My need for control, high dominance, conflicted with my need to not be controlled, which is low conformity. And in the middle of that double-edged sword was where a lot of anxiety and a lot of internal combustion was going on. As I didn't like to be told what to do. And I needed to be in control. And so it opened my eyes so much that I could see that that's where my conflicts were in my life. Like I was, I was unmanageable and I wanted to be in charge. Okay. And so, <laughs> so I, I became, uh, I became obsessed with these, these behavioral traits and what can I learn from this and how can I get out of my own way? And I started writing and developing tools. I mean, I became a behavioral assessment analyst. I got certified and I started just surveying leaders and people, veterans. And like I, like, like myself, when they, when they read through the little summary report and we talked about their traits, automatically they started seeing how they were getting, getting in their own way. So I took this on as a vocation and I found my calling. I found my career as a behavioral assessment analyst because I bumped into two guys at a Tony Robbins seminar and who are business consultants. And they, they showed me this, the use of these tools and anybody's listening. They're probably coaches and consultants out there. What are you using? Whatever tool they're using. The mass, the magic is in the magician, not in the wand, but people use the Enneagram or they use the Myers Briggs or they use the disc survey or the, the four quadrants, whatever it is. Uh, what I really appreciate about it is it helps develop a level of understanding about what the person's up against, like what, how they, how might they be getting in their own way and how can they be more effective in the world if they were more informed? How can we use this information, you know, to, to really help us learn how we're getting on our own way? Some people, there's just so many different ways of approaching this, but I found that by doing these surveys, uh, with a lot of veterans and a lot of people, people with depression, people with trauma, people with anxiety, it helped us really expedite, like what triggers you? Like what's going on in the consistency of how you get in your own way? And we were able to look at patterns and we were able to kind of decipher a code for each person that was really 
pretty cool and very prescriptive. So self-discovery was my way of recovering because I wasn't going to go to counseling. Most of the guys that I ran with, we weren't going to go to counseling, but we took to personal development, transformational development um, readily. Like we took it on, it was challenging and we could put the, put ourselves out there, but it wasn't talking to somebody that didn't understand the world that we operate in. Like a lot of the civilian counselors, I, I know a lot of effective ones, but at some level, unless they've been severely traumatized and they really understand what it's like to be in panic and fear and terror, you know, when you're hunted by people, when you're, when you're, when you're fearing for your life, you know, I've had some really wonderful mindfulness teachers try to tell me what that breathing feels like. And I'm no, I'm not talking about how to relax and breathe when you're stressed out or triggered. I'm talking about when you're in the moment where you could be killed and and you have people looking for you and you are, <laughs> um, you're trying not to breathe too loud because your heart's pumping through your ears and you know, people are going to hear you and you, and you, you got a really shallow, intense breathing pattern. It's, it's incredibly stressful, you know? So unless somebody really understands that it's hard teaching, teaching, um, breath work has probably been the biggest breakthrough for me. So I'm, I'm saying breath work is the key. Somebody doesn't have to experience trauma to teach breath work. That's not what I'm saying. Well, I'm saying, but when I try to talk to certain counselors, they, they just didn't seem to be able to, to relate to how trauma would wake me up in the middle of the night and shake me awake and cause me to ruminate and freak out, uh, about pending doom or bad situations are coming or be careful and I wouldn't be able to sleep. It's really hard to, to, to deal with that. So I've been on a quest to find tools for my own, my own personal self care. And the learning is in, is in the struggle. But I focus on a skills transfer model I learned in the military. Learn it, teach it, master it. Like you go and you learn something and then you share it with others. And in the sharing, you start incorporating it into your life and you start refining it. And then pretty soon as a level, you can attain a level of personal mastery over certain things. And so, that's how I experience a significant amount of relief. I still have trauma. I still have parts of me that are depressed. I still have triggers. But through these, through this learning process, I've been able to learn how to self-regulate very quickly to where I don't suffer anywhere near. I still suffer. Don't get me wrong. But my life is manageable. I have joy. I have high quality relationships. And I, I could not, I couldn't have any of that, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I agree. I think it's also uh, one of those things that you have to come to a situation where you become self-aware of, uh, you know, what you are dealing with, where have you gotten, like how far you maybe have spiraled and kind of like taking accountability because if you don't take that first step and acknowledge you have a problem or some situation where you're like quick to anger that's not proportional to a situation or like your coping mechanisms are usually like, you know, drugs or alcohol to kind of numb and stay numb and not feel what, you know, you're feeling. And like you mentioned, like out of the military, the suicide rate is like crazy high. You know, there's not enough done for military vets. We see a lot of homeless military vets with post-traumatic stress or other things that they've experienced. So I think it's, it's really important and, you know, a lot of people go through and civilians that haven't served. I mean, I, I was going to go to the Marine Corps um, and go to officer candidate school. I trained in the civilian capacity with the Marine Corps, but I got sick and didn't go. But I went to like the pre-ship PFT to like MEPS uh, to get like the physical fitness test done. And there were uh, soldiers there and somebody that already did tours that was switching from the army to uh, the marines and then there was people that were just enlisting like 17 year olds and asking that person like jokingly like uh, you know how's war is it fun and he got like kind of to a bad place where I remember we were sitting in a classroom and then like he straight told this kid he's like yeah it's fun to like see your you know friend that you've went through basic training get blown up in half it's it's really fun 
So it like took them to kind of a dark place. And a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. I, yeah. My son, he was a really nice guy, just super gentle, charismatic, you know, but, and one of the most scary people I've ever encountered, you know, and, you know, that's just what he was waiting for. He could just feel it. He's like, here it comes. You know, how many people did you kill? What was it like? You know, and he just tries to be nice about it. So I, I, when I'm talking to most everybody, it's just like, please don't ask those questions. You know, this is not, this is not something to be playing around with. It's morbid curiosity. Like, like I was in the, in the Marine Corps in between conflicts. And this is important because my dad was a traumatized combat vet. My son was a traumatized combat vet. I was in a special unit in the Marine Corps. Um, we, we traveled a lot. We got to do a lot of work with NATO forces, that sort of thing. But when I was in, we didn't get called up to go to combat. And what's, it's what every Marine, every soldier, everybody wants, needs to be tested, especially if you're a young, idealistic, you know, recruit. And that's, that's why you do it is I want to, I want to go be tested. And, and I was really, I, I called it combat envy. I had combat envy for a long time because I just needed that. And until my son called me from Afghanistan and said, I'm too fucked up to come home, you know, everything just kind of went away at that moment. They're like, wow. They're like you, you almost went in the Marine Corps and we would probably be having this phone, this conversation right now. You'd be a whole different person. Cause when you told me you were going to go in about when you were going to go in, that was in the thick of it, man. So you would have been an infantry officer in Iraq or Afghanistan and your whole reality would be different. And, uh, and it's an honorable thing, but, uh, you know, I, you, when you told me your background about, you know, migrating from the Ukraine and, and getting to the United States and growing up here, you know, it, it would have just, um, yeah, like I said, you'd be just, we would ha- we'd be having a whole different conversation right now. So for me, I found out that, um, you know, most of the combat, most of the veterans, whether they went to combat or not, the biggest disservice that we're doing as a military, as a government, as a veterans administration is we're not letting them know before they get out, hey, you're going to go through an identity crisis. You have your identity right now, which you can see on your uniform and this persona as a, uh, you know, as a service member. Every day you have a mission, like you need to complete these missions every single day. You know what they are. You know what the conditions for satisfaction are. And we're goal oriented individuals. We need that. And then meaning and purpose. I can tell you, you walk around, you're, you're serving people with, with all around you who re- rely on you. You rely on them and you serve in your country. You're part of a special unit. You've been galvanized into a mentality, especially if you're, you know, in the Marine Corps or in the army, certain levels of units. I mean, you develop a persona and an identity and a sense of deep meaning and person and purpose that is, um, it's hard to shake. And then when you get out, you know, you, who are you? What is your identity? Who, who's going to give you a mission? Like what gives you meaning and purpose? And the vast majority of veterans walk around with this big void and don't know what to do with it. And we get in trouble. We self-medicate. It leads to problems, the divorce rates, domestic violence. I mean, unfortunately for veterans, there's just, uh, there's not a lot of direction around, Hey, you got to reinvent yourself. You got to really go through a discovery process to really understand who are you without this military persona. And, um, some people get out. Like in the, if you're in the Air Force or the Navy or certain parts of the Army and the Marine Corps, you get a, you get trained in a vocation where you get a job in the civilian sector, okay? And so if you're traumatized and you have big time problems with that, you can turn your life into a new mission and you can avoid your problems by investing yourself. That's different because you 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 find something to do. But in later years, I find when veterans start retiring and those things start coming back up, they still have to resolve them or when we get out of, when we get in our own way and we get in trouble or we're having family problems or whatever, what I find myself most often doing is they need to get back in touch with that part of themselves that was extremely clear about who they were. And we often go right back to their military identity. What was the significance of graduating and becoming a Marine or whatever it was? 
And it's a way of kind of snapping back into identity, mission, meaning, and purpose and reorienting a person who's been successful after they got out. But I found most of the at-risk veterans that that I encounter that are suicidal or that are losing hope, they're in need of deep personal transformation. And that's what my work's about, really, is about how do you do that? How do you rediscover who you are and who you're becoming? And how 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 do you ask for help? How do you find mentors? How do you how do you find ways to relate to others? Because this isn't new. It's not unique. Everybody who's ever gone to war has gone through this identity crisis when they get home and their families desperately want to understand, but don't know how. So that's a lot of what I found myself writing about is how, how do you do this? And all these thousands of veterans that I've been able to work with over the last 25 years, you know, well, how do you talk to them? And what can you say that's not going to piss them off, hopefully, and cause them to think you're an idiot and walk away? How, how, what can you do to kind of develop a sense of trust that they can rely upon you? Which that's, that's a whole other conversation, but my, my, it's called the law of reciprocity. And there's four steps, four tenets. Number one, show up. Most people don't like show up and be present. When you show up for people, be there. And number two is do what you say you're going to do. Or don't say you're going to do it. I mean, it's really important, especially for vets. If you let them down, don't come back pretty much. And the third thing is care about the outcomes for the person you're trying to help. Genuinely give a shit. And then number four is ask nothing in return. And that's that has served me more than anything else. And most times veterans wonder, what the hell does this guy want? He's always nice to me and he follows up and he does what he says he's going to do. What does he want from me? You know, and then over time they realize that this is, this is what I do. This is who I am, you know, and it gives me purpose and it has helped me heal the wounds and the trauma by moving, moving that pain. So a lot of my work is about sharing these, these tools, sharing these resources, uh, for people for self care, internal, personal self care, but also move your pain. Go help others, be of service to others as part of your recovery, and you'll mature through it faster. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, I got to, you know, take the, the five minute survey offline prior to that. I think it's important to at least have kind of a baseline to understand if you're honest about what you're taking, because even if you're given, you know, a survey, a series of questions, or have a conversation, if you kind of sugarcoat past like the issues and make them less of what they actually are, then it's never going to, you know, be an accurate kind of sample set or, you know, anything in terms of kind of a data driven approach to solve a problem. And I think like you mentioned also, I think it's important when you're going through something, get perspective about what truly is important in your life, what you're thankful for in life. I know I've spoken to a few people where they'll uh, wake up and you know they struggle with different things and they'll write down on a post-it note like five things that they'll thank for they're thankful for and try every day to write it down but not repeat it something that they wrote down a day before you know ever so like that exercise and especially like dealing with things seeing how other people live certain things you may be going through and then you you know see like myself as a foster parent with kids you know, three, four, five year olds have gone through more so than most adults will in their lives. It puts things into perspective and sometimes kind of realigns your, your thought process and helps you kind of, like you said, when you're at service to others, when you're going through something, I think it's like very therapeutic and helps you through your own journey as well. Yeah, you're not alone, you know, and and I also find that being able to talk to individuals about what they're working on um, and not just generalizing things like do this and everybody will be happy and this works for everybody. Well, it doesn't work for everybody, you know? So I, I really look at, you know, just really being more prescriptive. Like what, what are, what, what are the unique characteristics of the person that I'm trying to help? Like you took that little communication survey 
uh, took five minutes, just a bunch of adjectives. Okay. But, um, you, you mind if I just give you a little snapshot of what it is that it gleaned? Sure. No problem. So basically, uh, I'm going to send you a little report from, from it, but, uh, but basically what it said about your traits is that you like complex subject matter, like problem solving. Like there is a, there's a, a, a level of complexity and a level of structure and a little level of detail orientation that this tells me you can handle. So if I just wade into conversations with you with no substance and no structure, uh, uh, no strategy, uh, and just want to small talk and chat with you, that's probably not the best strategy. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, it's also kind of like my upbringing. So I like, like getting to the point. I, f- I feel like a lot of the time, like, you know, a lot of conversations are superficial when you meet someone that's just like figuring out how that person can benefit you in a way. And it's not like, um, you know, a meaningful connecting. So like a lot of like, like even yesterday, I was at like an event, a conference where there was networking to really like weed through that because I hate like, you know, what do you do where you're from? And then like, oh, maybe you can help me. And it's like, I'm not interested in that. But when it starts being a deeper conversation and it like connects, then I kind of like uh, put on, you know, a switch where it's like, okay, this is like, you know, positive. Right. I, I work with uh, a lot, a lot of different people and, and veterans. They have similar traits. It's almost like a very, it's like a structured, like a scientific uh, mentality where there's the ability to understand really deep, complex subject matter. So that's what fundamentally it said about your traits and the fact that you're able to get on these podcasts and, and engage people. I want, the more podcasts that I listen to of yours, they're, they're specific, they're meaningful, they're intentional. You're not just getting on to small talk and chat with people. There's like, it's really interesting subject matter. Okay. And so the ability to get into how things work and how they matriculate into, you know, processes and methodologies. So there's a, there's a lot going on with, uh, I think the intention behind, you know, um, like digital savage experience. Like there's, there's a lot going on in the, con- in the conversations I've heard in your podcasts. So, so that gives you a little snapshot. There's a lot more to it than that. But if I'm talking to somebody who's more personality driven, highly extroverted and exuberant, we're going to have a whole different engagement. Okay. Or if they're super warm and sincere and they don't like conflict, I'm going to be mindful about engaging in too much difficulty in the conversation. Um, and if somebody is really super structured and they need detail and they need, they need to make sure things are done correctly, that's a whole different conversation in and of itself. So. So these types of resources are really helpful when you're getting to know people. And, and quite frankly, you're right. If I just said, Hey, take this survey and I didn't know you. If you didn't have a reason or a purpose, you kind of kind of, you're going to get kind of any, any kind of response. It's unpredictable. But if you create a reason, like when I'm dealing with veterans, you know, you want to go to school or you want to get a job? I want to go to school. All right. So let's, 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 let's get in possession of some insights that will be helpful for some outcome-based education. Let's take this little survey. If they say, I want to get a job, okay, then let's look at some career planning. Let's look at some vocational planning about what you might more naturally be fit to do. And so let's take this little communication survey. So when I have a purpose and an intention behind taking it, people are much more likely to get invested in the outcome. And we have really authentic, important conversations about where they want to go from there. Yeah, I agree. And uh, like you said, it's kind of like not one one size fits all, uh, you know, with, with a lot of things in life and in business. I, I'm coming from the marketing field. So a lot of agencies I've worked with, it's kind of like a cookie cutter approach. Everyone gets the same thing and it's going to work and deliver results for everyone. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You know, some people take medication to, to deal and cope and get in a mindset. Some people don't need that where they can use more like holistic approaches, you know, prayer, religion, and other things like that. So figuring out kind of like what your healing process is 
and what you have to kind of overcome, I think, leads you to, you know, a better result when it's tailored to that specific person and what they're going through. And, and like I said, even with marketing and in general stuff, like my aspect is like I'm very kind of like data driven or I need as many facts. And, and sometimes I overanalyze, especially if I'm taking a test or something like that, I'll go, I'll finish one of the first people, but then one of the last people to turn it in. So I have to be like meticulous and kind of second guess myself a lot of the time play out like every scenario before i even do something which at times is positive and sometimes it's not because you know i i lean to the side where there's too many negative things that can happen and potentially i'm not going to do that but I mean, i've had to overcome that because that that's taken away from certain ex like rewarding experiences so stuff like i'm afraid of heights but i went skydiving so at some point where I was pushed out of the plane, at that point, I can enjoy it because it's either, you know, you land or you don't. But getting me to that point was that kind of like obstacle or hurdle, hurdle that I had to overcome. Well, yeah, I, if, if we're looking at personal development and I'm I'm thinking back at, at, at your traits, you're using the descriptive words like you, you'll you'll analyze things like crazy. So one of the things that I discovered for myself <clears throat> was how to reframe. Like when I get triggered and when I work with people and we start identifying what triggers them, like for me, it was like disrespect, being disrespected. Okay. When I, you know, I was in the military, I got in a lot of trouble because of that. Um, a lot of conflicts. And, but when I started asking myself a question, do I really need to be irritated with this person right now? Or is it just my need for control getting in my way? Is this just my need for respect getting in my way? And every time I ask myself that question, I would say, oh man, this is my nature and I'm getting tired of it. I need to do something different. So I started asking myself that question sometimes 50 times a day because I was working in cultures and organizations that were really irritating, but I started noticing my nature. And when I work with people that have like this high conforming need for structure, I need to get things done correctly. Uh, their biggest concern typically is they hate being caught without the answer. Does that sound familiar? So the ability to, the ability to not know is a, is difficult for people that have like what I call high conformity. And so what they do is they become obsessive. They, they over prepare, they overstudy, they become encyclopedic about what it is that they want to think about and talk about. Why? So they don't get caught without the answer. And so once we discover that, wow, that's an obsession, that's a block to communication because sometimes you'll spend so much time in paralysis, th overthinking things. One of the things to break that loose real quick is, do I really need to overfocus on this right now? Or is this just my high conformity getting in my way? Like, do I really need to be obsessing this much? over something or is this just my need for perfectionism getting in my way and when you can ask yourself very prescriptively that that key question based on your traits um or another thing that's said about your traits is people may be trying to be your friend too quickly butting up to you small talk chattiness like you mentioned before like you'd be the probably one of the worst people to try to sell something to because you don't like to be sold to <laughs> i mean i don't know you but this is what i've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of different people that have very similar traits and they don't like to be sold to. They don't like to be fluffed up. They like to be straight. They like to get right to the point. That's their preference. Can they small talk? Yes. But um, so being able to see how you get in your own way and being able to ask yourself better questions when you find yourself stuck. It's like, do I really need to be irritated with the person talking too much or is just just my introspection getting in my way, my reserved nature getting in my way. And if you can find a couple of questions to ask yourself when you notice that you're stuck, when you notice that you're triggered, that key question changes everything. It changes your outlook. It changes your perspective, your expectations, and you can literally step out of being stuck and start opening up the possibility of something new. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, like you mentioned, it's like impossible to sell me something because I'm so uh, skeptical. Um, I'm the, the person that never responds on LinkedIn in terms of a pitch or just like, well, we'll question 
something with like I guess a snarky response or whatever. But um, but yeah, I mean, that's fairly accurate. And like you said, it's it's hard for me to. Um, I, I'm friendly with people, but it's hard to like become my friend. Like I have a core set of people in my life that I've had, you know, for a while. And, um, you know, I trust them. I've kind of like, you know, went to war with them at one point or another through, through life. And it's kind of hard to, I guess, get in my inner circle. And it's not against the, the people or the, you know, the people that I've surrounded myself with, but I feel like those people that I've met along the years in recent years and business or personal have let me down in one way or another. Like it's like, um, a limiting factor, like, you know, losing my trust. And I kind of like my approach is like guilty until proven innocent. Like, yeah, I'm setting up the situation that you're potentially going to let me down in one way or another. And I don't want you to get close to me to to do that because if it happens and you're not like a trust friend, it, it, you know, to me, it doesn't affect me as much. It doesn't hurt me as, you know, if I let you in and like that happens. So that's kind of like my rationale to it. What was encouraging for me when I asked you, would you take this survey and explain why? Like you genuinely have an interest in helping people uh, and, and helping them figure out maybe what they're up against. And you know, in my conversations with you, that's really what rang true is that you're willing to be transparent and like, sure, I'll do the survey. And then we're talking about it now. But this tells me also that you're a really private person, you know, and for us to be talking about these things, you know, uh, thank you, because this is, this is really how this works is it's like jujitsu or martial arts. Like I'm not, I'm not highly proficient, but I understand enough to where it's like, you got a great idea. Why don't you bring it on the mat and let's see how it actually works in reality. Otherwise, it's just a good idea. And your traits are among the more complex that I come across in any organization and in, in society because of this complex problem solving mentality. And so it's not surprising that I would hear that there are a lot of people that probably think they're closer to your circle of trust than they actually are. But when they do earn their way in, it's like ruthless loyalty is what I typically encounter, you know? And so, um, so you're, this is really, this is really interesting because your, your traits are typically one of being really introspective. But I think what's, if I were to say something more in depth about it, when I work with people that have similar communication styles of yourself, there's two different parts. There's a warm, sincere, engaging part, and there's a critical, direct part. And it can go from one to the other lightning fast. Like somebody can be startled because it, it can go from warmth and engaging to very critical very quickly. And that can have a startling effect. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I've, uh, I've done that. I mean, it's something that I kind of try to, um, I guess, work past, especially in like relationships with family and friends and like my wife and also like the dynamic of one not understanding kind of that switch and two, like the the things that impact me as a man and what I've experienced versus what, you know, impacts and emotions, women are highly different as well. So that kind of like not understanding, like thinking that, you know, I'm mad or angry, but I'm actually fine. But it's like that kind of switch going off, like you said. Well, this is a great, this is a great for introspection because like, this just tells me that when you're not smiling and laughing at my jokes, it doesn't mean you're pissed off or you're angry or you're irritated. It just means you're in your head, right? <laughs> so that's yeah, pretty that's much. Really and uh, I've had that in kind of like networking things. It's like, oh, are you enjoying yourself? You look like you're like kind of distant or like upset. And like, no, I'm fine. I'm I'm not like a person that follow stoicism but like coming and being born in eastern europe during the former soviet union just kind of the mindset and being kind of oppressed as a society and uh, being able to worship and stuff like that i think that has an impact on all of society and how my parents kind of started raising us and then we came over here so i think there's a there's a level of that as well I have a close business associate who's very similar in his communication style. 
and we'll be on calls. And afterwards, I'll be like, how you doing? I'm fine. Well, why don't you tell your face? Because uh, <laughs> you look like you're thinking way too hard on these calls. And so he has to consciously think about, oh, okay, how am I coming across? You know, a little more so than he would naturally do. But because uh, we're in the, we're, we, we deal with people and clients all the time. And so it's something that he has to remind himself of is to, is to really come out and be more engaged, be more personable in those moments. Cause when he's just in his head, he looks super serious. So, um, so thanks for letting me talk about these traits because this is, this is really what's, uh, what's important is I, I train a lot of coaches and consultants and people in the addiction and recovery community, how to use these types of tools to better understand why people self-medicate, um, to better understand people's triggers. And so once you understand what you're up against and what triggers you, you, you can self-regulate because our life happens between our triggers. But if you're walking around triggered all the time, you won't know the difference. But by doing this work and starting to identify what are my triggers, how am I getting in my own way? You can recognize more quickly, wow, I'm triggered. And I actually help people understand, say to yourself internally, wow, I'm triggered right now. Or like I'm, if I'm with my wife, I'll say I'm a little triggered right now. And she knows that I'm okay. I can take care of myself, but she doesn't have to try to jump in and do anything. And it's actually helped us a lot because she'll just give me some space. I'll self-regulate. I'll come back and I'll be just fine. You know, but these are little tools that can, can, can really help a lot. And so helping people identify what they're, what they're triggered by and how much time they spend. Like what happens is once you start recognizing that you're triggered more quickly, those episodes that may have been full blown start shrinking into little blips. And pretty soon you're triggered for a nanosecond instead of an hour or two. And our life happens between our triggers. So that's really what a lot of this, what my work is about. That's what I write a lot about in my book is just how do you understand your traits? How do you understand your triggers and how do you self-regulate? And, um, so there's a, there's a, some processes that I do teach that are kind of prescriptive, but, um, but mainly it's from the personal experience of being in a traumatic episode. Like how have I been able to find ways to work through it? And the more I share this with other people, the more they find that they can, they can, they can borrow it. They can take it and make it their own. Yeah, I agree. So I really appreciate you stopping by today. Can you let the audience know how they can find you or they can find the book? Anything else you have going on? My first book is called uh, Transitioning Veterans, How We Get in Our Own Way and What to Do About It. It's an audio book that's on iTunes and Audible. But if you go to transitioningveteransbook.com, if you're a veteran or somebody who cares about veterans, you can listen to the whole hour and 20 minute long audiobook right there on the website without having to buy it. It's a legacy project for my son, Danny, you know, and uh, he helped me conceptualize this whole thing and he was supposed to help me record it. But uh, so I finished that project in 2017 and uh, my latest book is called Be the Dawn in the Darkness, the Relentless Pursuit of Becoming Who We Are Meant to Be. And if you go to harvestingwisdom.com, you can check out some of the chapters for free. You can listen to f first four, four chapters for free. Uh, there's an audible uh, audio file and you can, of course, find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Uh, so that just came out in uh, late March of 2023. And so the reviews that I'm getting back are pretty incredible from a lot of different folks from different walks of life. And, you know, I think a lot of men get a lot out of it because this is about men's work. A lot of my work is about men's work. But there's a matriarch, my great aunt Gladys, throughout the whole book that is a very powerful, intelligent woman in my life since infancy that was able to provision me for the hero's journey that I was on. And she stayed with me into my, into my mid forties. And when she passed away, she just, she, she just, shared a lot about for me about how to live my life. And my wife said it really well. She provisioned me to save my own life at a very young age. So this book is about Gladys. It's about honoring her as a mentor, as a matriarch of our family. Um, 
so this book is for men and women, anybody who suffers from trauma, anybody who wants to have a better life and wants to get out of their own way and wants to learn how, like all of us have a critical mind that's telling us whatever it's telling us. It's hijacking precious moments of worry, about fear, about panic, about being careful, about being critical of others. All of us have a critical mind that's robbing us and hijacking moments. But I just want to tell everybody and remind everybody that that part of you works for you, not the other way around. And there's a way to reel in that habitual negative aspect of ourself to where we can have a life and we can learn to manage that part of ourself because it's not really who we are. There's a part of ourselves that needed to handle things that, that becomes that critical mind. But if we can understand how to tame that critical mind in a way that doesn't feel, it doesn't feel threatened, that we're not trying to kill it. We're trying to give it a voice. We're trying to understand it. It becomes a lot more manageable very quickly. So that's what a lot of this writing is about and, and the audiobooks are about. Awesome. Thanks again for stopping by. Good to see you. And I look forward to talking to you again real soon.